Hello everyone, welcome to this Radcliffe session from the ESC and uh, I'm live here at the ESC with our two chairs of the new cardio-oncology guidelines. It's been a momentous uh, last few days in cardio-oncology, the first international comprehensive guidelines in cardio-oncology and who better to take us uh, through them than Dr. Alex Lyon from London and Dr. Teresa Lopez Fernandez from Madrid. Thank you so much for being here and uh, taking us through the guidelines. Thank you, and thank you for inviting us uh, to present the uh, uh, new ESC guidelines on cardio oncology. As you know, these are the first uh, ESC guidelines on cardio oncology, and for sure, I'm, I'm sure that you are aware that this is a multidisciplinary teamwork. Uh, and we always, when we present the guidelines, we want first to thank all the task force members for the incredible work they did, as well as the reviewers and the ESC team that support us uh, during the last two years. So this is the general overview of our guidelines. We include uh, 272 new recommendations that are formed regarding the most permissible but also the most efficient cancer treatment. And uh, we cover all these different topics in the guidelines. So guidelines provide new definitions and uh, also uh, strategies for personalizing uh, the prevention and the monitoring of uh, different cancer therapies, as well as uh, how to manage the potential problems that uh, this patient could develop during and after the, the cancer treatment. And we also focus on how to organize uh, the long-term surveillance of uh, this patient and also on special population. So this figure summarizes uh, two of the key messages of the guideline. The first one is that uh, the risk of suffering cancer therapy related cardiovascular toxicities is a dynamic variable that changes through the pathway of care. And that's why we need to organize uh, personalized uh, monitoring during and after treatment. But the first step is uh, to really focus on how to adjudicate events in cardio-oncology and that's why we introduce as a first chapter in our guidelines uh, the new international definition of cancer therapy related cardiovascular toxicities that include also this uh, new descriptive term of cancer therapy related cardiac dysfunction. We try to describe with a CTRCD the broad spectrum of heart failure syndrome that may occur in some patients. So symptomatic CTRCD means symptomatic heart failure, and we have different degrees of severity, and according to this severity, we make appropriate treatment decisions. And we also have different degrees of asymptomatic CTRCD, that means asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction based on different cutoff of ejection fraction and VLS and also on the increase in cardiac troponin. The first step when a patient has a new diagnosis of cancer is to try to stratify his or her baseline cardiovascular toxicity risk. And we need to use tools that manage all these cardiovascular risk factors and also previous cancer history and previous cancer treatment. And in the guidelines, we support the use of this Heart Failure Association and International Cardio-Oncology Risk Tool. These uh, tools have been published a few years ago by these uh, two uh, societies and try to summarize for different drug classes what are the risk factors that are more important we need to consider. And uh, when we feel these different performers that are now available at the, the ESC APP, you can establish a different level of risk of your patient according to the treatment he or she is going to, to receive. So after this baseline assessment, that of course include a clinical assessment, also an ECG for all the patients who are going to receive cardiotoxic cancer therapies, and other tests like echo or biomarkers according to the level of risk. So once you finish your baseline risk assessment, every patient fits in one of these three categories, low risk, medium, moderate, medium risk, or the high and very high risk. 
and that's the only way the oncology team can make appropriate treatment decision. We can also educate patients to promote healthy lifestyle and we need to educate patients on their own cardiovascular toxicity risk because we need them involved during the, the treatment. And of course, we recommend different degrees of referral for patients. So we manage uh, different uh, protocols for monitoring of uh, the treatment, and this is an example. This is anthracycline chemotherapy surveillance protocol. And as you can see on the uh, left, the different risk categories, and according to these ca risk categories, we establish precise recommendation on ECG, troponin, echo, or in other classes of drug, other, other type of uh, complementitis. And now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lyon, who is going to talk about the management. Thank, Thank you, Teresa. So I think it's important to emphasize that this is a guideline for the cardiovascular diseases in cancer patients. And so in the management of cardiovascular disease, we focus on where treatment decisions are different to patients without cancer, which are of course covered in other ESC guidelines. And the different factors you should consider for a patient with cancer, of course, is their cancer-related symptom burden and their cardiovascular symptoms, what their cancer stage and prognosis is, the treatments that they've been receiving, and potential future treatments, including non-cardiotoxic alternatives, the cancer drug, cardiac drug interactions, and we have an extensive list of those in the data supplement, and of course patient preferences. And we cover a whole range of the different cancer therapy related cardiovascular toxicities as summarized in this slide. Just to give one example, uh, which is the management of trastuzumab uh, targeted therapy uh, and its related dysfunction. And this is relevant to all the HER2 targeted therapies. So once a patient has had the problem uh, diagnosed, you'll see in the upper third of the algorithm, are they symptomatic or asymptomatic, and what is their severity, as per the definitions that Teresa has just shown you. In the middle third of the algorithm are the decisions on oncology therapy. So severe cases, trastuzumab is interrupted, uh, whereas we'd like to highlight in asymptomatic moderate uh, CTRCD, where the ejection fraction has fallen to below 50% uh, but in the range 40 to 49 if the patient's asymptomatic it's a class 2a indication to continue trastuzumab with close cardiac monitoring and then in the lower third of the algorithm is the cardiovascular management plan so patients with moderate or severe CTRCD whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic should have heart failure therapy that's a class 1 indication and for mild asymptomatic CTRCD, which we see more and more with surveillance. If the GLS has fallen or biomarkers have risen, it's a 2A indication to start an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker. And here are examples of the algorithms for anthracyclines, for Takotsubu syndrome, checkpoint inhibitor related myocarditis. We also cover the dis very difficult topic of the choices of therapeutic anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolism different cutoffs for arterial hypertension when it's caused by a cancer drug and also QT monitoring and how to manage the patient on a cancer treatment who develops QT prolongation. A really important new area is a focus on an end of cancer therapy cardiovascular risk assessment. We've heard about it at the beginning. We now have introduced the concept of doing it in the first 12 months when the patient has completed treatment because this will enable you to guide what their long-term strategy is. And here is a table of the risk factors for identifying people at high risk for future development. Now, another uh, important topic is long-term surveillance and we know that some patients develop their cardiovascular problems years after initial treatment and again we can divide the groups into low medium and high risk and this will guide us on the frequency of 
surveillance, for example, with transthoracic echocardiography. And on the right, you'll see we have risk factor groups, both for the adult survivors of childhood and adolescent cancers, and below the risk factors for adult cancer survivors and who is high risk and needs this closer monitoring. And in the final clinical section, we also focus on some special populations seen in cardio-oncology services, that's uh, patients with primary cardiac tumors, the valvular complications of carcinoid syndrome, uh, cardiac AL amyloidosis in patients with multiple myeloma, and the group of pregnant women who develop a cancer during pregnancy that needs anthracycline chemotherapy. We also have these algorithms for identifying and how to manage patients who've got a cardiac implantable electronic device such as a pacemaker or a defibrillator where they need radiotherapy that could interfere with the device. So again we just want to thank all the uh, co-authors who've helped to build this uh, guideline and work tirelessly over the last two years and we really hope it helps you in the management of these complex patients. Great, thanks so much uh, Alex and Teresa for that fantastic overview of the guidelines. So generated a lot of interest, there's been a lot of buzz here at the conference and also kind of online so we've got a number of questions coming through. So uh, first of all we have a question from Irma Bisclia. Um, one of uh, the questions I have relates to the placement of biomarkers in class 1 in high-risk patients undergoing anthracycline treatment and the serial blood test required in each cycle as 1B. Um, this can create a number of extra blood tests for patients. Um, do you have any comments regarding this? So maybe, Teresa, if I could start with you for this one. Yeah, well, not sure that this uh leads to extra blood tests because uh, before each cycle of anthracycline, the oncologist uh, did a blood test. So sure. we just need to click yeah. the, the button of troponin or NP pro VNP. And uh, uh, we think and reviewing all the literature that uh, biomarkers are quite cheap and quite easy to uh, help the monitoring. Is it true that there are sometimes two sensitive and we need to interpret the values in the clinical context of the patient. That's why it's very, very important to have baseline values because if not, we cannot identify what really means uh, an increase in, in cardiac biomarkers. But um, especially for anthracyclines and especially for patients who are going to start stisumab therapy and receive previously anthracyclines, there are a huge number of articles that refer that uh, these uh, biomarkers can detect mild asymptomatic CTRCD and probably is to treat this uh, mild asymptomatic CTRCD is the right way to prevent a serious event. So but I think it's an important message that although it's a class one, don't bring people in for an additional blood test. Yeah. Take the opportunity when they're coming to the chemotherapy unit and getting their baseline bloods. And you don't delay the, the chemotherapy that day, it's how you interpret it for the following cycles. And would you recommend that it's the oncologists who lead on this process or and tell the cardiologist if there's a, a rise or a problem? Yes, I think for a lot of these uh, guidance, particularly the baseline risk assessment and surveillance, all the patients are in the oncology clinic or haematology service. Yeah. So, so we need to work with our haematology and oncology colleagues to educate them about the guidelines so they can implement the, uh, the, the advice and the recommendations, but know what to do if a troponin value rises or if the GLS reduces. So they've got to be educated about GLS, a new concept often for them. That's an interesting question. So we have a question on GLS, so it leads nicely onto that. So is it possible to have an abnormal LV strain in oncology patients who have no other cardiovascular risk factors and what would you do in that context? Uh, so uh, that's a great question. I'm getting to think about the pa pa one of two patients. The first is the treatment naive patient. So if you've got someone who has uh, got no previous cardiovascular history, they're treatment naive and their GLS is reduced at baseline, it still raises the question why in the context of a normal ejection fraction. And we know some cancers release uh, chemicals that are potentially cardiotoxic, particularly some of the very metabolically active cancers. 
acute leukemias, some of the very rapidly progressing lymphomas. So we do see cardiac dysfunction at baseline and that patient is a higher risk. Then we also see the GLS falling during treatment and maybe that's a different population where they've now had a delta change and then the guideline gives advice about what to do with those patients. A uh, specific question on checkpoint inhibitors. Um, do you recommend any screening prior to starting checkpoint inhibitors for medium to high risk patients? Maybe Therese, if I could start with you for this one. Well, in fact, uh, we, we divide the population who is going to, to receive immunocheckpoint inhibitors in two groups, low and moderate risk and high risk. And is it true that when we compare with other cancer drugs, the definition of the high risk group is not so precise sure. as in other uh, scenarios? But um, for sure, patients at high risk are those with previous cardiovascular diseases who are going to receive more than two drugs or two immunotherapy combination who are going to receive at the same time chemotherapy, radiotherapy. So uh, to have a baseline risk assessment of this patient is critical, particularly with biomarkers, because some of these patients have a high level or medium increase in NT-proBNP or cardiac troponin because of previous history of ischemic heart disease or just because they have a high cardiovascular risk. And if not, it's very, very difficult to interpret the results uh, during, the, during the treatment. So the guideline says everybody who's going to receive a checkpoint inhibitor should have an ECG and the troponin measured at baseline and the high risk patients get the echocardiogram. I think it's just so we know what's going on and often these patients can have symptoms and they haven't really had the management, they've got a new progressive malignancy, so there's also the opportunity to help. So I think one of the key things my take home from the guidelines is that a lot of baseline assessment for all cancer patients to just understand where we, where we are before something happens. So how best to kind of manage this? Should we be doing it as cardiologists or is the burden then on the oncologist? I mean, practically, how can we implement this? So I think it depends what the components of the baseline assessment are. So we've got the HFA ICOS risk assessment. It's now actually in the app. So if the uh, oncology colleagues and hematology colleagues download the ESC guideline app, they can have the interactive tool and in their clinic be able to calculate it. I think they can do ECGs, they can do the blood tests. We have to have a relationship so they can order echo rapidly. The first echo for a patient is a comprehensive echo because we don't know what we're going to find and thereafter can be focused. So as a cardiology service, we've got to work with them to be able to deliver what they need. But some of this is their responsibility because we can't see every patient on these treatments. We need to see the right patients, which is where the guideline says it's a class one indication to refer the high risk patient pre oncology treatment. Of course, in the context that time allows, it's not an oncology emergency that, that where they must start treatment. Um, there's an interesting question, maybe slightly outside of the guidelines, but related. Uh, should we be doing specialized cardiovascular safety RCTs with oncology drugs similar to those done with anti-diabetic medications? So a bit of a kind of, um, not a loaded question, but maybe yeah. relevant for future guidelines. Well, I think my approach is if you don't know the cancer drug works, then it's not worth spending a lot of resources to do a safety study. So, so if the cancer drug works, then we need to think about how we manage that. In classes of drugs where we know there is a cardiotoxic signal and another trial's being done, the checkpoint inhibitors or a VEGF TKI and another treatment, it seems logical to do a cardiovascular safety sub-study and maybe something on everybody, troponin or ECG, and then a sub-study looking at advanced imaging that could then pick up where we have a, a, a true concern. But if it's a first-in-class drug, uh, and, and these are coming down the pipeline a lot, I think we need to know they work on the cancer first. So, Teresa, there's been a lot of talk about the late effects part of the guidelines, and I think a lot of people welcome this very much. Um, some of the questions that I've been hearing from general cardiologists is how can we fund such a service, and you know, should it be cardiologists or should it be oncologists? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a really difficult uh, piece uh, to, to organize uh, because we have a huge number of patients to, to manage and of course again, as during the treatment, 
in the cardiology services, we cannot be the only ones who take care of these patients. So again, risk stratification at the end of cancer therapy give us the clue which patient really needs a specific cardio-oncology follow-up that uh, with uh, the help of the oncologists, hematologists and also GPs, I think is the right way to organize uh, the cardiovascular surveillance of cancer survivors because we need to perform a yearly cardiovascular risk assessment, a standard cardiovascular risk assessment. And just in a few patients who are treated with a specific drug, we need other specific complementary tests. That uh, what we need is to promote healthy lifestyle in these cancer survivors because the statistics give us high numbers of uncontrolled cardiovascular risk factor in this population. And uh, the, the first doctor that sees a patient with poor control cardiovascular risk factor needs to go to deal with. And maybe it's that, that first year, the end of year assessment, they're still under the oncology clinic. So, so there we're liaising with the oncologist, but then there'll be that natural transition from oncology care, hopefully if they're cured, to the primary care, and the cardiology team has to then coordinate with both. Okay. So there's a question now on 5FU. Um, asking um, any role for algorithms about heart failure and direct toxicity due to 5-FU rather than um, you know, ACS or ischemia? So we do see this. I think we have not included an algorithm specifically because really there's no data out there as to A, how common is it? B, what should we do? It's very difficult, but we do see it in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, but compared to the more vascular toxicities of the fluoropyrimidines, which are more common, um, so I think that is clearly in the area of the gaps in evidence. You know, we need future studies to provide the data so a future guideline can then directly address that. But we have not covered that topic really because there was very little in the literature and we didn't feel that uh, that was a topic that we could include. But we recognise that patients do exist with it. Great. So I think that uh, that's uh, most of the questions that have come through and I'm uh, aware that we're kind of coming towards the end of our time. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you for answering all the questions that came through. And maybe if I hand over to you, Teresa, to give your last uh, take home messages. Wow. So maybe we, the, the, the key, key messages is that we need to stratify cardiovascular toxicity risk and we need to, to work really close to the oncologists and the hematologists for this task, but patients are in oncology and hematology clinic, so we need to educate them, as Alex told you before, to try to organize good referral pathways to the cardio-oncology area. And uh, another really key point that sometimes is forgotten is the re stratification of the risk at the end of cancer therapy. So, because if not, it's really impossible to organize a, a comprehensive cardiovascular surveillance for these patients. Okay. Thank you so much uh, once again to uh, Alex and Teresa for your very uh, great work over the last, uh, you know, so many years to get this uh, to fruition. And, uh, hope the audience uh, and most importantly our patients will benefit from the new guidelines. Thanks for joining us.